Welcome. This is the Punk CX Podcast. My name is Adrian Swisco, and I'm an advisor, best-selling author, Forbes contributor, and general explorer of the service and experience space. On the podcast, I seek out and interview entrepreneurs, leading business people, authors, tech leaders, academics, and generally cool people doing interesting stuff in the service and experience space. Check out the archive at adrianswinsco.com. That's enough for me. Let's get into the interview. So welcome to the next edition of the Punk CX Podcast. With me today, I have Greg Kilstrom. Um, and Greg is a speaker, author, and advisor, but he's, he does a bunch of different things. And I know him kind of through Mark Smith for, uh, that was on the, the podcast previously. He was talking about journey orchestration, which is sort of Greg's lane as well. Um, but he's going to tell us a little bit more about himself kind of in a minute. But first of all, I just want to say hello and welcome to the podcast. Greg, how are you doing? Good, good. Thanks so much for having me. Looking forward to this. Brilliant. So, um, as I said, Greg, um, for the benefit of our listeners and folks that might be reading the highlights and things, um, can you tell us a little bit about you, yourself, the work that you do, all that sort of stuff? Yeah, sure. So I come originally from a marketing background. I uh, started, ran, and sold a marketing agency primarily in the digital experience space. I sold that about five years ago. And, and since then, I've been working still in the marketing and the customer experience uh, space, uh, working as an advisor and a consultant to, I would say, Fortune 500 brands primarily, um, and really working with them to every organization is going through some kind of transformation and every organization understands the value of customer experience, but they don't always know what to do with it and, mm -hmm. and really how to reach their goals. And so I, I work with them to do that. I've also written a few books. Uh, I think we'll talk about that a little bit as well. I'm a speaker and and I write for a few publications as well. So just, I really, I I pride myself on being very hands-on with this stuff, but also taking that, those learnings back and then writing about it and trying to share as much as I can. Awesome. Now, um, people know that I, as you say, you write books and this is, that's the primary reason that I asked you on, uh, on to the show because actually you've got a new book out, which we'll talk about in a minute. But also because um, you reached out and you went, I got this podcast too, and we went do it. We thought we'd do a bit of a podcast kind of like swap, and then talk about just different kind of things. But um, and the name of your podcast is what's the Agile? It's called the Agile Brand. The Agile Brand podcast. So, dear listeners, do check it out. It's going to be awesome. Um, but it, the thing that we we're here to talk about is you've got this new book come out and it's called house of the customer, which reminds me of a song called the house of love, uh, mm -hmm. or a band called the house of love back in the day, I think it was. Um, and it says house of the customer, a blueprint for one-to-one -one customer first employee driven business transformation. It said it all in one breath. Um, so can you tell me about it, Greg, and how it came about, what's his main thesis and also who's the book for, and also not for more importantly. Sure. Sure. Yeah. That's, um, it's uh, the title's a mouthful, I know, <laughs> but um, but really, what I I wrote the book because uh, you know I I think we all if if we're in the customer experience or the marketing space, we read a lot about how good it is to have a great customer experience, and you know I, I always say like we're I think we're already all bought into the premise that you need to treat your customers well and you need to have a great customer experience, but how do you actually do it? And mm -hmm. I think we're also as a marketer and a, and a CX um, strategist, we also like our buzzwords. And so we like things like one-to-one -one omni-channel personalization and multi-touch attribution, customer lifetime value. <sighs> yeah, yeah. All, all of these things that, I mean, admittedly are very important. But first of all, they are what I call North Star goals, where most organizations, they're not there today. They're not going to be there tomorrow, but it is something that they can get, that they can move towards incrementally. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, as the title of my podcast, The Agile Brand suggests, I'm a very agile, iterative, you know, kind of mindset person. And so I wrote the book to bridge the gap between those very North Star goals where, you know, there we're, we're years out from reaching those for most organizations. Mm -hmm. um, and how do you actually incrementally get there? And what do you actually need to build in your organization to do that? And I use the metaphor of a house to do that with a, you know, with a roof and floor and, and walls and, and columns and, and things like that to be able to say, okay, these are, these are the things that you need to have in place. A lot of organizations may have some of those really well done already, 
but they may be uh, lacking in other areas. And so I, I go through that and, and set not only that, but some frameworks to measure things like business value, to measure prioritization or to determine prioritization, really step through to get to start reaching those 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 goals. Excellent. And you know, you say you wrote, you've written a series of books, but, but this book doesn't stand alone, right? It's actually kind of the third in a series. Is that right? Yeah, I've written, so I've, I've written a few series of books. And so this, this one is more about the operations of, of how these things are done. And so I, I wrote the first book in the series I called The Center of Experience. And that really lays out a, a framework for building a center of excellence around both customer and employee experience, because I believe those two things are, are very much related. Mm -hmm. uh, the second one goes a lot deeper into measurement. Uh, it's called a meaningful measurement of the customer experience. And I just look at, you know, going beyond things like net promoter score and, and some other of those that are the go-tos in, in the CX world, just going beyond those and thinking, okay, how do we actually meaningfully measure across the entire journey and, and things like that. And then this is really um, from, I, I would say it's it's geared a little more towards the marketing crowd, um, certainly a lot for CX professionals as well, but it's geared a little towards the marketers and those that new customer acquisition as well as the customer retention um, aspects. Okay. Now, so I kind of, I don't want to, we don't want to go to, through the book soup to nuts because right. there'd be no point in people buying the book. Right. Um, so to give people a flavor of the book, I wanted to ask you uh, like just a couple of questions to give people a little bit, almost like, like, like Amazon does the peek inside. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and so the house, as you referred to it, which I really like because it's sort of an analogy that I've used in the, you know, in the, in the past when I've talked about companies should be almost like focusing on being brilliant at the basics. Uh, but not the, what they think the basics are, but the, what the basics are for their customers. And almost like those are the foundations that you build kind of like relationships or, and you build trust and credibility and reliability and all these different things on it. Because there's no point putting a big fancy roof on something if you've got shaky foundations, right? right. So I really like that kind of whole house idea. So your house is made up of all these different elements because you sort of break it kind of down. It's a bit like an ar architect schematic. <laughs> Um, so can you briefly describe for me the kind of the different elements of your kind of like house and how they all fit together? Yeah, sure. So the, the foundation of the house is really the culture of the, the organization. And I, I call it an, an agile customer centric culture. So, um, it is iterative because we know we can't achieve everything all at once and mm -hmm. things are moving too quickly to plan in the, in the first place. And it's customer centric because I believe when customer experience is done well and when everyone's role in an organization is tied to CX, it's both motivation as well as reward. So you're mm -hmm. motivated to create a good customer experience and you're rewarded by delivering that customer experience. And that, that can be shared across everyone in the organization. Um, that's bookended by the, the walls of the, of the house, so to speak, are really, you know, business, business goals and business outcomes. Cause those mm -hmm. are, those are always going to be important. We can't, we, we need to value our customers, but we also have to stay in business. And so yeah, we yeah. need to find what those things are and we need to make sure that we're achieving them. Um, in the middle, I, I call three pillars, which is um, you know understanding our customers, serving our customers and listening to our customers. Mm -hmm. And go in, I go into some detail about you know the, the, some of the first party data struggles that we have, um, you know moving everything from cookie third party cookie deprecation, all that stuff to really serving great customer experiences. That's one of the things that um, you know I, I uh, took, talked about with Mark Smith from CSG that you mentioned, mm -hmm. talking about that journey orchestration. You know, how do we serve them across the entire journey? And then finally, listening and um, and measuring those experiences so that we can get better. And it all kind of translates into this feedback loop. And then the roof over the house is the processes and the the systems that we have in place to basically protect us when, you know, when things go way off course, what do we do? And, you know, so we have governance over, um, over all of those things. Okay. You know, I think it's, it's, it's like an overarching kind of like framework and different kind of pillars. It's almost a bit like, as you say, the business goals and the business outcomes feels like they're like the outer walls Yeah. and the bits inside are like the partition walls, all the different rooms that sit above the kind of the, the house, but it actually is going to have the, um, the, 
um, the right sort of foundations in place. Yeah. But you can talk about the, the the one thing you mentioned just there, which I want to come back to, is you talked about this kind of first party kind of data because actually one of the things that I think that you're really interested in is this kind of like the, the you know the the drive towards one to one engagement or personalization, you know those sort of things, and and how journey orchestration fits into that. Yeah. And that's a big part of the whole kind of North Star kind of um, side of things because you talk about the kind of the, the um, you have to get clear on your North Star. And that might, might be a North Star that's achievable today, but it's something that you want to aim for um, um, tomorrow. But it's only the way one of a number of elements in that North Star that you, th- you believe that people have to think about before they're going to get clarity about what they're going to do. And, and I, I wanted to ask you if you can help me understand what are, the, what are those different elements we need to, if you like, take account of or think about, full factor into our thinking if we're going to get this North Star clarity, which is going to align us with what our, what we want to achieve and which will drive those outcomes, but also kind of what our customers want, want to um, achieve too. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, there's there's four things that I that I outline, and so you know the first is the that one to one personalization across all channels, and again, doing personalization on one or two channels is pretty simple for most organizations doing it across all channels offline and and online is is still a, quite a quite a challenge for many um the second one is that first party data strategy so you know ensuring that you know a lot of some brands are are way far ahead on this because they've been doing this and they've been having direct relationships with their customers for years but um, a lot of like, let's say in the CPG world where they've been going through traditionally, you know, third party intermediaries, big box stores, all of that, they, they may be struggling a little bit more than some others because they've now third party data is becoming, you know, more and more difficult. It's, all, it's always been a little expensive and, and can be unreliable, but now there's, there's even more hurdles in place. Um, the third thing is building a customer lifetime value model, which is, um, to truly understand the value of a long-term customer. And, uh, you know, it's always important to acquire new customers. Again, I come from a marketing background, like it's, you're never going to stop hunting for new customers, but to truly appreciate, I've also been in sales. And so I can, I I also appreciate the idea that it's a lot harder to win a new customer than it is to keep a a happy one. And so building that lifetime value model and really understanding how can we grow relationships. Um, and then um, the, uh, the the last um, part of that is building this this agile um, customer centric culture, which is really um, the driver ultimately behind this. I mean, leadership needs to lead, but they need to build the kind of culture and the framework that can sustain that that belief in the customer and and just that continual experimentation and growth. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing that, that it feels to me that the um... That sort of the the vision of this kind of one to one personalized engagement sort of model, as it were. Um, yes, it's getting dominated by t- talk about, as you say, the deprecation of third party cookies. Although kind of Google seems to be kicking that can down the road, just so it can figure out how to kind of like create new revenue streams that that that's going to replace the ones that it's going to cannibalize, right. or it's just going to you know, be cut adrift from. Um, but it's not just a marketing thing. And it's and I think that this is where it plays into the whole sort of first party customer kind of view. And I think, because I've seen all sorts of data and research around this, around um, saying that some 50% of, of marketeers or CMOs are ready to go on this and they're working their way towards that. And yet there's another sort of 50% that are a little bit like, we're fine until kind of like, until the rubber hits the road, sort of thing. So, once you, given that you're more immersed in that particular part of the the, the market than than that I am, what's your view in terms of the state of readiness of many of these brands? Like, say the FTSE 500, not FTSE, um, yeah, yeah, you know, the kind of the top 500 kind of like firms, the, the bigger brands. What's in your view is how ready are many of them for taking on this? first party driven personalization approach and then also going kind of the next level and driving towards like a first party and zero party 
kind of view? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a great question. You know, I think um, most most of the larger brands have some um, some steps in place to do. It. I, w- I would say most, if not all, have are are on their way towards that. Now, how far along they are, it it greatly varies from you know from from what I've seen. And so, you can have one of the one of the things that you need to really do a first party data um, strategy well is a customer data platform or, or something that's collecting this data from from all these other places. I'd say most large organizations, they may have one or they may have five in place, and that's its own problem having yeah. having a bunch of different systems. So, in other words, there's the there's the one way of looking at it, which is, oh yeah, we've got this covered because we have a CDP or we have a platform in place. But then there's the whole other part of it, which is, okay, well, what are you really going to do with that? You know, do you really have a a plan to do it? So, in other words, from a from a platform perspective, I think most lar- most of the Fortune 500 have something in place to, to be collecting data in a meaningful way and, and things like that. On the execution part of it, I would say there are many that are not far enough along to really replace um, that the third party reliance that they're that they currently have. And so, I to put a number out there, I, th- I would say maybe fifty percent are ready now. Um, and probably another half are um, probably at this point scrambling a bit to, to get things really in place. And then that's just the top companies. I think when you go down another level, there's a lot of companies that are nowhere near ready to do it. Um, mm-hmm. And and that's I, I think when you get to that next 500 down, maybe you know there's there's a lot more variance, and you know maybe they have a few systems in place, but it's uh, you know it. It's a it's a different. I think it's a, a different kind of equation then. Yeah, I mean, I, I also going to wonder about the um, how mature and holistic their uh, people, many brands' view of personalization is, because it seems to be that kind of personalization <clears throat> gets dominated by um, marketing. Yeah. I mean, that's where the big spend is, I guess. And where people kind of like it's where they where the engagement kind of is, and as you say, everyone wants to try and, try and keep or you know find new, new customers. But I wonder how, and it may be keen to get your view on this. Is like how mature you know you have to say fifty percent are ready with the sort of infrastructure in place. Like they've built some of their house, they need to kind of like decorate, have right. a few cushions and throws around the place. Um, but like how. Of those fifty percent, like how mature? How many of them do you think have a mature across the the customer kind of like life cycle kind of view of kind of personalization? I.e., that personalization is something that 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 gets woven into every interaction, and it's not just about sales and marketing. Yeah, I mean, in the so in the book, I um I I did a bunch of research on digital maturity and, and experience maturity, and you know, it's a little difficult to get um that much depth on, you know, omni channel, you know, across every single channel, but, you know, it's a, I would say 50% are, um, of organizations at least are in the lower tiers of, um, you know, of that maturity scale. And then we've got, you know, we've got out of a five, you know, we've got the the other 50% in the the top three. And so even that, even those very top organizations, like there are going to be disconnects between, you know, when you think about there's new customer acquisition, there's the, you know, customer relationship, the CRM type, mm-hmm. um, there's customer support, there's, you know, all of these different areas. And there are still disconnects, even in the largest organizations. And, but to actually do personalization well, you know, it's it's one thing that a, a customer support rep might be able to pull up my customer record, but it's a whole other thing to actually proactively send me relevant information and, you know, make my life better, maybe make some revenue as well, of course, but, you know, make my life better as a customer. That's, yeah, that, that I would say that, that number is a lot fewer and, and, and further between. Yeah. And I think it's because it, I, so given that you're, you're a bit more, um, well, you're a bit more exposed to this sort of stuff as than than I am because I think it more. I come at it things from more of a, um, I guess, a service perspective rather than kind of like a marketing perspective. I mean, I have this idea that, you know, the ultimate customer service is no service at all. Yeah. 
that's kind of that's the thing. But we're all humans, and we have a, a kind of like proclivity towards kind of like having problems and not understanding kind of things. And so sometimes we reach out and we need kind of like help. And I think that what the thing I can think about is that they wouldn't it be wonderful if you end up with say a support center or a contact center sort of like set up where somebody kind of calls in or kind of emails or messages in and goes, I've got this problem and their records kind of pull up and you can see what they've been up to. And it kind of goes, blah, 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 that's fine. Let me help you out. I'll sort that out. I can see the problem is, da, 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 bosh, bosh, off you go. So sort I of think, oh, by the way, before you get me, and let's all help with real-time guidance and automation analytics and all these different sort of things. But also at the same time, I'd love to see somebody kind of create the opportunity for somebody and a representative when they have when they're trying to solve a customer's problem, if they have a positive resolution for them to turn around and go, actually, before you go, do you have like 10 seconds or 15 seconds to answer a couple of quick questions that will help us serve you better in you know in the future? And then you take that, you ask them a quick couple of questions, they go, yep, yep, fine, whatever. And then the data that's gathered from that is automatically parsed out and then fed back into your CDP, CDP and your CRM and your customer decisioning hub and all these different things. And it automatically updates the one-to-one engagement model around kind of what you would like and prefer and, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, yeah. Th- is that where it's going? Well, I would say it's even it's even going, at least in, in my opinion, beyond that, which is um, collecting real-time behavioral data before you ever get asked the question. Right. So to me... As a person that doesn't like to talk to people on the phone, uh, I that, I know it's funny. I have my own podcast or whatever, but I hate talking to people on the phone. It's like, I the the ideal scenario would be okay. You know, the, there's always or there's often an offer that's made or like to just a generic offer that's made to you know you call your in, car insurance company or whatever, and and they try to sell you on boat insurance, and I don't have a boat, right? Um, so you know, but what if it was actually something very extremely relevant to me, I would likely buy it because mm-hmm. they know I, I have the propensity to buy that. They've seen that. They've seen the behavior that I've taken and they've actually offered me something relevant. And therefore it's not an annoying thing of like, oh, they're trying to sell me boat insurance for a boat I don't have. It's they're trying to sell me this specific thing that, oh, wow, yeah, I really need that because I just bought X, Y, Z or whatever. So, I mean, to me, it's anticipating, it's using, it, it's tracking what I'm doing in real time and anticipating what I might need. And then whether that's delivered by a human, by email, by text message, whatever that case may be, that's also dependent on me. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't mind getting text messages. And so that's not, but other people may hate that method of, of marketing. And so don't ever send those people SMS messages, send them mm-hmm. an email if they prefer email, you know. So to me, that's where it's that's where it's really headed. And that's true omni-channel one-to-one. And that's why you don't see it a lot right now, because it's 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 just not that prevalent. And do you think that kind of and does that fit into would that fit into first party data or would that fit into zero party data? And or that's do you a think- little it's a little of each. Yeah. Right. I mean, so the the first um the first party piece is um, you know, you're being tracked. Well, I mean, you're being tracked whether you like it or not anyway, right? So the, the I think the value is, can we use that information about what, what I'm doing to actually provide value to the customer as well as the business, of course, but to, to provide that. So some of that is zero party in the, you know, I'm, I give, I'm giving it willingly and I'm providing it. Some, some of the rest of it is first party in that I'm taking actions and they're being recorded or, or tracked and, and though, and, decisions are being made and propensities are being calculated based on those behaviors that I've, I've, uh, you know, acted on. So I'm going to kind of, um, thank you for that. I'm going to pull us out of that rabbit hole and <laughs> kind of get back to the, get back, back to the book. Forgive me for kind of like going down that, that, you know, that rabbit hole, because I think it's really interesting. And as you say, a lot of this stuff is still North star for people. Yeah. It's still out there, but you've got to, like you say, with the house, you've got to set up the foundations and the kind of the the, the walls and the roof, and in order to prepare for that. Um, but going back to the book, um, there was a really interesting kind of thing that you said in the book where you talked about, and I think I know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Is like why is an 18 month plan an exercise in futility? Yeah, I mean, I think anyone that 
created an 18 month plan in January of 2020 um, could probably answer that as well as me is, you know, we just don't know what's coming down the pike. And, Mm -hmm. and so um, if for, you know, there's, there's competition, there's disruption, which may also be competition. There are just the unforeseen, you know, the pandemics, the economic downturns, the job market changing, all of those kinds of things. And so to be able to say that I know what's going to happen a year, year and a half, two years out, I I would be foolish to say that. Now, it doesn't mean that I can't have a goal for 18 months from now. It just means how I get there is undoubtedly going to change. And also, I may be wrong in the approach that I think we should take anyway. Mm. And I should be humble enough to be able to, uh, if I'm a leader, if I'm Whoever, if I'm the strategist coming up with this, I should be humble enough to say, I don't have all the answers. We have a goal. Here's the best guess, because that's all any of us have. Here's the best guess on the first part of our step towards towards that. We're going to revisit. If we did a great job, we're going to keep doing more of the same. If there's room for improvement, we're going to iterate and and optimize. And the, um, because I know you're kind of like, you're, you're, you're kind of a, about this, but it's like the yeah, so you, you're right. I agree that the um, having a goal is like fine, but being kind of you know adaptable kind of to whatever happens, and we've been forced to do that. Then that becomes down to um, execution, right? Um, yeah. And that's the, the really important part, and particularly when you're t- you're talking about trying to deliver customer outcomes, but it's reliant on technology and data and, and culture and all these different things. So, so what sort of things, what sort of, in your research and your experience, what sort of things should we be looking out for when executing? Yeah, I mean, I think um, when executing, we need to build in, I, I mean, this is the, use the scientific method. I mean, you know, it's, it sound, it, it, that sounds rather I know we're in marketing, we're in CX, we're not, we're not scientists, but we should be using the same methods as far as defining an experiment, um, going to anybody that's done statistics, you know, the null hypothesis, all of those Mm -hmm. kinds of things, like we should be defining what success looks like before we start an experiment. So we're not biased by that experiment because we get so caught up in loving our own work and, and being proud of, of what we did that we kind of, we sometimes compromise on our goals. And again, being being nimble and agile towards reaching a goal doesn't mean we change our goals unless they need to be changed, I guess. But like it doesn't mean we compromise on our goals. It just means we're flexible in how we reach that and we're very scientific about okay, in the last 3 months did we move closer to to our goals and how close and is it close enough given how far we are from our goal and and then modify and, and create a new test if needed and, and things like that. And, and doing that and being regimented about it, it gives us, you know, it, it, when leaders sign off on, on that approach, I mean, it's, first of all, I think it's hard not to sign off on a very scientific approach that's open to change when something doesn't work, but um, it, it can be a bit, um, it, it can be a bit different for those that are, that are used to kind of winging it, I guess. It's also good. I think it's also good that the, the uh, it goes back to that culture type of um, yeah that you mentioned, and also kind of the leadership, uh, the type of leadership you have, because you yeah. know many organizations have the um, are fraught with the what um, somebody once told me that about was the hippo effect, you know, the highest paid person in the room's kind of opinion yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. And that sort of drowns everything out. And also the idea that people don't experiment because it means that they may end up having to admit that they're wrong. That's and, a good point. Yeah. And I think that's the kind of the thing. You almost have to get over that, get comfortable to to before you start an experiment. It's all very well to kind of like to set that up. But actually, you've got to, you know, sometimes it starts with us, right? It starts with kind of us around how we approach things. It's like, yeah, you know, we have to start with maybe questions rather than opinions. And 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 be okay with the idea that we might not ask, we might not get the the answer that we want, and therefore that's kind of you know we're we're always kind of learning. And I think it's interesting about the agile kind of approach because I always I often kind of like hear stories about kind of how things haven't necessarily gone as well as they they, they might because they get dominated by the vagaries of people and personalities, the different characters. Right. Right. Yeah. It's it's. 
it, people are, you know, it's, it's the biggest opportunity. It can be the biggest challenge. Right. I think that's, um, you know, I think a lot of companies, they think, okay, well, if we just buy the right software or, you know, to hire, you know, create the right department or, you know, something like that, then all of these things fix themselves. But, yeah. you know, it's, it's the people in the processes um, that, that are really, again, they're, they can be the greatest roadblock, but they can also be the, you know, they will, people and processes will be the thing that makes something successful. And yeah. I, I think to your, to your other point about, I, I think it's, um, you have to be comfortable with failure as an organization and you can't treat it as something that is taboo. And, and I think to, to what you were saying about leadership, I mean, that, that is a top-down thing of, no, we cannot fail our, you know, our 18 month or five year goal, but we can fail a million times as we reach that goal. And the, the more we fail, the more we learn. I mean, I just know that personally, <laughs> I've, you know, yeah. I just, once I got over that, um, you know, I, I was able to see things a lot more clearly and, and, and stuff. And it's hard, you know, it's hard yeah. to do that. And some cultures just, it's almost like an impossible thing to, to be able to accept that, but you can't experiment if you're not willing to accept failure of an experiment and move on. Yeah. I mean, I think the, um, I remember in the punk CX books, I, a book, I used a piece of graffiti that I took a, pic- a picture of. It was on a telephone exchange cabinet that said, uh, it went, dude, sucking at something is sort of the first step towards getting kind of good at something. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I love that. And um, and it sort of, and it's made me kind of ask questions of kind of people, kind of when I've kind of talked to, to people about that. And I've asked them, it's like, so here's the thing. I said, when was the last time you sucked at something? Yeah. Yeah. And if you can't answer that question, then either you're not paying attention or you haven't really tried anything new lately and not really kind of failed. And I think it's a really good question. And it's probably a really good question for many people that are listening to the um, to the podcast. And I also was thinking about kind of some of the stuff that you're either talking about and the stuff that's in the book is it's, and I don't mean kind of like sucking at something in terms of like an epic fail type of stuff. I'm talking about going, it could be a, just a small thing. It could be a faux pas. It could be something that you've done in a meeting or in a conversation you've had or an email that you sent to somebody or a thing in a campaign or you've tried a different piece of copy or a different color or a different size or something, whatever it might be. It, it could be all of those different things. And so I think it's, um, you're absolutely right. It's like you've got to get comfortable with failure because that's only how we can grow. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I know from my experience, you know, I, I do a bunch of speaking now and I would not say I'm the best speaker in the world by any means, not even close, but um, 2010 was the first time that I did any public speaking and people, you, I was terrible. I was just utterly, I like, I don't even know what I said. My mind was like spinning and and I was nervous and sweating and like, had no idea what I was doing. And now it's like, again, I'm not the greatest public speaker in the world, but I'm not afraid to go on stage in front of, you know, a few hundred people and say what I know. And if I don't know it, actually admit that I don't know the answer to a question in front of hundreds of people as well. But that took a lot of time. And that took being, that took sucking quite a few times to do that over many years. And I just decided, you know what, to, to your point, if I'm, completely comfortable in everything that I'm doing, then I'm doing something wrong. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, I mean, they also can like, um, so just mindful of time, Greg, I just say the, the um, I really like the book because it's, it's, it's quite specific around a particular approach to, to achieving something, particularly around um, helping people kind of, define and, and navigate a, a roadmap towards this kind of one-to-one personalization engagement type of model that, that many people have been talking about. And I like the way that it, it talks about kind of data and technology and kind of culture and all the kind of different building blocks that go with that. So I think it's, it's a really, um, it's a really useful guide oh, thank um, you. to that. So, um, so fair play for, for putting that together, but before we move on and, I want, and ask you maybe a couple of just, general kind of questions. Is there anything else that you want to highlight about the book um, that we've missed out? Um, 
No, I mean, I think I think we did a pretty good, we did a pretty good job here. Yeah, I mean, I, one thing I just as I mentioned very briefly, you know, there's a there's a few frameworks beyond the metaphor of the house. There's a few frameworks in there that that I've found really valuable. I think you know one of the and I'm working on a new book on this topic even, but one of the biggest challenges that I see in organizations is prioritizing what to do and and mm-hmm. when to do it and. Um, so I, you know, that's that's another thing in that book is just a framework that kind of assigns business value to things to help. And I've used this with, you know, with a, a number of organizations that I consult with as well, just to, you know, we have a list of 25 things that need to get done tomorrow. Well, that's not going to happen. So mm-hmm. what do we do first and why do we do it? Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think that's a, that's another important thing to, um, you know, for organizations to have and, and to do it consistently because a lot of, a lot of, a lot of people are afraid to say, no, I can't get to this or no, I can't do this. And to have substantiation of, well, I can't do this, but here's why um, can, can really help. Yeah, no, absolutely. So thank you for that. Um, so zooming out a little bit, just to, and, and as we kind of approach the end of the show, I just wanted to ask you a couple of quick questions. One is that um, the last kind of like, I guess now 20, 21, 22, have been uh, different, let's say, um, and for all sorts of different ways. We don't need to go into that. It's kind of obvious uh, if you've been awake over the last kind of like three years. Um, so what are some of the biggest lessons that you've learned over the last two, three years that is in, going to inform the way that you do things going to going forward? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I've just learned every, every time I um, think I'm – flexible and uh, nimble enough from a business perspective, I learn ways to become even more flexible and nimble. And I, I try to, you know, I'm, I'm primarily an independent consultant and and things like that. So it's relatively easy to be, um, to be those things. But I I think it's a lot of organizations. That's what I try to pass on. It's just that, that way of being, I, to me, it's, you know, I'm, I'm an agile certified coach. And so I've been through all that training and stuff, but when I say agile, I'm, I don't mean that there's only one way of doing things to be nimble and, and agile, you know, small, a agile, I guess. Yeah. Um, but you know, I, I try to pass that on and and I try to do that in both my professional life and, and I try to be nimble in my personal life too, because I, I think it, the, the two have to be balanced. Excellent. And um, if I was just put you on the spot and say, all this down, best advice for someone listening in that wants to improve either their customer and employee experience. And it would be, Greg says, dot, 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 fill in the blank. What would you, what would you fill in the blank with? Yeah. Um, I would say to set your North star goals and, and start incrementally moving towards them, not finish them tomorrow, but incrementally move towards them. Perfect. I think I would agree with that. Um, as a found particularly as a foundational step, because it's always surprising to me, kind of how many people don't really have a very clear vision of what they want to try and achieve. Yeah, I know it sounds so fundamental, but it you're right. I don't I don't think there's enough there's enough of that done. Yeah, and and I also think I would go further, and I would say that yeah, some people have it, and it's all it feels like a buzzword bingo list. Yeah. But um, I challenge people to tell, try and tell a story or, or write a statement or a short story or something that says, here's what it is that we're trying to do. This is what we envision it to be. And try and strip out all of the different things and try and make it as human as possible. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. So find a couple of things before we go. Um, punk questions, um, I, which I'd like to ask you two of. First one is, and this is the challenge, the ongoing challenge, word association thing is what I say, what one or two words would you use to describe a more punk approach to, to CX? I warn you, I've got 171 of them. So you've got to try and kind of be super creative to get on the list. The, wow. The yeah, glove I, has been, the, the gauntlet has been thrown down, Greg. What have <laughs> you got for us? I, yeah, I know. I should have looked at that list first, but I, you know, I would say unexpected. Unexpected, right? Let me check. Unexpected. Who? Un- uh, yo, sorry. Uh-huh. Uh-uh. You want <laughs> another go? Um. <laughs> oh wow. Yeah, I don't know. Um. Oh well. 
I mean, that's, that's, uh, how about personalized? personalized. Oh, personalized. Uh, we've got personalization in there. We could, I can maybe, I can squeeze that in. Okay. Okay. I'll squeeze that in. Personalized. Brilliant. <laughs> and final kind of one, uh, punk question is because this is based on the whole idea that it's not sufficient to talk about just customer experience anymore. We have to talk about experience as a domain, a multifaceted domain. And I wanted to ask, like, what company or brand do you think is like an experience leader? Like, who's nailing it? Who's got the whole kind of knitted together, stitched together kind of like story kind of like going so far? What do you think? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I think this is also from personal experience. American Express, I'm a huge fan of of them. I've I've been a customer for a while and I've used even a few brand new products of theirs that were, um, I would say, in various states of um baked, half baked, however you want to call it, but right. Consistently receive great customer experience through them. And I, you know, I know some people on the, you know, on the business side as well and, and know some of the things that they do on the on the back end. But yeah, I would say they're they're definitely a, a leader in my book. Awesome. American Express. Not they have not appeared kind of before, kind of on this, um, in terms of having that a, a shout out. So it's always good to add another name to that. And then one final thing. You know, um, because, you know, I find myself trying to kind of keep myself away from doom scrolling when I wake up in the morning and I have my first cup of coffee and then it's more of the same old um, stuff. And um, so I've been trying to, over the last kind of few months, been trying to ask people to end on a good news story or a positive note. And so I've been asking them, What's the most interesting, positive, or exciting thing that you've seen in the last week? Wow, in the last week. Um, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> it's, I guess it's been a rough week, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing, nothing's, nothing's immediately um, coming to mind, but um, wow, yeah. Okay, so I'll save you here. I'm going to save you by telling a story about something which we had a bit of fun with. So my wife and I were out at the weekend. We just went out, went to kind of one of our kind of favorite restaurants, kind of a uh, uh, um, little Thai place in, in Edinburgh. Yeah. And there was this big group. There must be about 18 of them. And, and it's a small restaurant. And so this big group kind of dominated the space. And they were like... They were making some noise. And I was a bit like, meh, I don't care. My wife was a bit like, mm, maybe they've been a bit too loud. And they would end up talking to kind of the people kind of next door. And the guy was a bit like, meh, I think they're maybe they're too loud. And the lady was a bit like, ah, I think they're fine. But I'll tell you what it was. We ended up, and it was great to just have that kind of interaction, a, a random sort of like kind of thing, rather kind of when you're in a restaurant and everybody's like head down, sort of like kind of, kind of eating away, kind of like talking to each other across the table. And it's all a bit secret. And it was nice to feel like you're in this kind of like ah big melting pot of all sorts of different things kind of going on and different people responding in different ways. And then we also got a chance to speak to a couple of the people and it was, they were this uh, disparate group of uh, union representatives, like a workers union. Now, whether you like unions or not, doesn't really matter. I'll put that aside. But they were a disparate group that had come together for a couple of days in Edinburgh for this big kind of meeting from all over the UK and I think it was the end of the, the their week, and they were just having a rare old time. And I just thought that was a really nice thing to see: a disparate group of people coming together, having a rare old time, and making a bit of noise, and um, and sort of changing the atmosphere a little bit. And I think it just it felt when we actually before we understood that. It was you respond to the kind of the noise in sort of different ways. Oh, they're just loud, or they yeah. should be a bit quiet. But when you understand it in context, then you look at it. It's like a disparate group of people kind of come together just to kind of like end of a week or end of a few days, kind of like working together, having a conference, conference or a workshop or whatever, yeah. and it just made sense. And I thought that was just a nice thing. And yeah, it's great. That was, people- we had a, we had a good laugh about that. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, no, it's it con- context matters, right? It's uh yeah. Excellent. Anyway, so that was my story for this week, but just kind of like a few days ago, which was kind of great. But so that's it, Greg. Uh I wanted to say 
So first of all, thank you for sharing your time and your experience with us today. Congratulations on the um, um, on the on the book and the books, as it were, and the fact that to hear that you are working on another one, kind of in the um, in, in the background, is like the guy's a machine, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and all power to you for for the Agile Brand kind of podcast. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it. Big thanks. Yeah, well, thank you so much. It's, it's been great talking with you. And yeah, thanks, thanks for having me. Wow, what a great interview. I hope you enjoyed it. I know I did. Find out more about me and the work that I do at adrianswinsco.com. Do leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. And if you have any comments, feedback, or questions about the podcast, then feel free to send me a message to podcast at adrianswinsco.com. And do tune in again. Thanks very much.